Hello, my friends. This is Pastor Christopher Alam at home in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I trust you and your household are doing well and are blessed. Uh, we are talking about the subject of uh, God's grace and man's faith. And first we talked about grace, the subject of grace. Now we are talking about faith. And today I want to share with you about the battleground of the mind. The mind is very often the battleground of faith, although faith is not a mental operation. Faith is of the heart. Um, that's for you to understand that faith is always of the heart and it's not of the mind because the human mind is not uh, created to uh, operate in the realms of, of faith because uh, the human mind can only operate in the field of the intellect, but faith is of the heart. So, but at the same time, the mind is very much involved uh, in, you know, when it comes to faith, because the mind wants to uh, get in there and give its input when you're going to act or move or speak in faith and often negatively because the mind because the natural mind cannot accept the things of God. And I will, I will come to that later on. But I want to begin to tell you this, that the mind is a great battleground, not only uh, in your faith life, but in every other area of life. Your mind is, the, is, the, is a big uh, battleground. So, uh, so the Bible also talks about the renewal of the mind. So, uh, you know, there are people who have issues who have mental issues, uh, mental illness or mental, uh, you know, other things which may not be illness, uh, mental illness related, but other issues with the mind. And so there are many, many different nuances of different things that have to do with the mind that are, that uh, work on you in a negative manner. So the question is, can one be free from those things? Yes, and the Bible tells us how. And I'm going to get to that. And we're going to talk about the renewal of the mind. And I don't think we'll get to that today in this lesson, maybe the next lesson or the next. But I want to spend some time talking about the mind so that you understand. And maybe you who are listening to me are struggling with your mind in certain areas. And I'll try to explain to you why it is this way and how you can be free from it because you can be free. The thing is that all of us, if not all, almost all of us struggle with issues in our minds in some way or the other. And I've had those. We have all had those. Uh, and I'm not talking about uh, mental illnesses or disabilities. I'm just talking about we just struggle in, in our mental areas. And so um, I want to tell you how you can live in victory above those things. Um, you know, as long as you're on this world, uh, there will be all these impulses hit your mind from all sides. And so you'll never be in a place where your mind is never assailed or attacked by anything. But I want to teach you how you can be victorious over those things and how you can be victorious in your faith. All right. So let us look at the mind of man the way people's minds are today because of the world today. And, uh, and I will explain to you what I mean by that. Um, there are several reasons why uh, people are the way they are, and that includes you and me. First of all, people have a lot of, the first reason people, uh, you know, uh, the first uh, set of issues that people have with their minds is because People carry a lot of hurts because of the breakdown of the family and of, and of marriage. And uh, there's a lot of hurting people out there. People have been hurt because they have been rejected or their marriages have broken down or their family unit uh, isn't what it should be. I mean, I grew up in such a home. I had a happy childhood until I was eight. And then my father and my mother, they split up when... Uh, when I was eight years old, my mother left the family. I never understood why. I understood later on in life, but uh, I was about 60 years old at that time. But I suffered my entire childhood because my father married another lady, and this lady was very cruel. She used to 
beat me up almost every single day. So I carried a lot of emotional scars and wounds in my life that, that, that followed me all my life. I left my home at 13 uh, and joined, uh, joined a military college. And so, uh, you know, joined the Air Force College. So uh, I was basically brought up by my instructors and my drill sergeants. And, but uh, it still hurt. The way I had been at home still hurt. And by the time I was 15, I was suicidal. The only thing that kept me from actually killing myself was that Islam taught that suicide was a cardinal sin and that a person who kills himself uh, would go to hell and there's no mitigating circumstances. Then when I was 17, I, I tried to get killed. Uh, I mean, it was terrible. I lived a terrible life and um, then I met Jesus and then even after I met Jesus, it was like that pattern. Although there was a huge transformation in my life. Don't get me wrong. My, I felt like I had been cleansed. My sins had been washed away. Uh, but my, the patterns in my soul, the hurt, the rejection still remained uh, to a great extent. And, um, and, and, they, and I couldn't understand why, uh, but because, uh, you know, I mean, I really, I really fought and struggled through a lot of things in my life. It took me a long time to realize what was wrong. And it took me uh, years in the ministry helping others uh, to understand why I was the way I was. I realized that all my hurts, everything had become a pattern in my life. Although I was saved, I was married, I was living a good life. But just because your tormentors are gone, uh, or they're even dead doesn't mean that the hurt will also go away because once that uh, that hurt and that rejection uh, takes root in your soul it becomes a part of you and it has nothing no longer anything to do with the people who hurt you and tormented you and then you've got to deal with these things so what I'm saying is that that's the way I'm that's the way I was my life was and I know a lot of other people who have been hurt because their marriages are broken or they come from a broken marriage, they're children of a broken marriage. Even today, when people tell me they're getting divorced, I'm horrified because I think of what they're doing to their children because of what I went through coming from a broken home. So people are hurting because of the marriage breakdown and the family, many children are brought up by a single parent uh, because uh, their father or mother, often the father has, have, has left them. And so, you know, it's, it's sad, but that's the world today. Now, in contrast with, the, uh, with when I grew up, you know, I'm 66 years old now, but uh, when, when I grew up at that time where I grew up, divorce was a very rare thing. In fact, I didn't know of any other divorced couple until my own parents divorced. And that was the first time I ever heard the word divorce. I didn't even know that it was possible for a man and a woman who were married to leave each other. I mean, you know, that's how uh, clean and quote unquote the world was at that time when it came to marriage and divorce. And now it's like, oh my goodness, a huge percentage of the marriages today get a divorce. And so you can imagine the number of hurting people out there today. And anyway, the, so there's hurt people, there's wounded people, there's rejected people. People feel rejected, they feel hurt, wounded, cast away, mistreated for many, many reasons. Now, then there's dysfunctional people. Dysfunctional people is uh, uh, people who, because of their past experiences, they, they cannot function well uh, in, in a social context. Now, I know pastors, uh, for example, guys I went to uh, to Bible school with, and you know they they learned. You know, at Bible school we learned to handle powerful spiritual forces. We learned about faith. We learned about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We learned how to heal the sick, cast out devils, and and <laughs> some of these guys <coughs> at that time, uh, you know, they came from wounded, broken backgrounds, and they were dysfunctional uh, in their personalities and they went to the ministry and they learned to preach and I mean they could preach they could 
flow in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and they did very well as preachers. Uh, as preachers, they did very well, built big churches, big ministries. They were greatly popular and sought after as speakers. But as human beings, they were, I mean, handicapped. They were dysfunctional. They were no good as husbands, no good as fathers, no good as friends. Uh, some of these people, they have, uh, they are great preachers, but they have zero when it comes to relationships. You look at their families, their kids are a mess because they're just dysfunctional human beings. There's a huge uh, gap between who they are behind the pulpit and in ministry and who they are as people. And that is because a lot of our Bible colleges, we, we, uh, we, how do you say, we don't know how to raise or to foster people who haven't been fostered or raised right by their parents who are dysfunctional. So they learn Bible knowledge and all that, but they are not discipled uh, to be good fathers, to be good husbands, to be good uh, friends or good parents, you know, so there's a lot of dysfunctional people out there, even in the ministry. And then, then comes another factor, all the pornography and other filth that is out in the world today. I mean, it's incredible. When I was a kid, you never had those things. And even if there were, you, we didn't have access to these things. These things, any, these days, anybody with a mobile phone, or a, a, a computer has easy access to pornography and it's all over the world. Pornography has polluted more people's souls, their minds than anything else in the world today. It's a multi-billion dollar industry and it pollutes people's minds like nothing else. So, and, and, and nowadays, even the movies and the films, you know, they, uh, they are so graphic. The images that leave in people's minds are so strong that these things leave a big footprint, a big impression on people's minds that, that follow them long after the screen is switched off. It just follows them wherever they go. So we didn't have those things when I was growing up, you know. So the world today, my point is that the world today is more complex and much filthier than it was in those days. So the things that people struggle with these days, uh, the giants they have to fight are far greater than the giants we have to fight as kids. So that is the world we are living in. So because of all these, people's minds are affected. Then the other thing is people are desensitized to violence. I live in America and people, uh, you know, people talk about guns and uh, look, I'm a hunter, I'm, I'm a gun owner, but there's this, uh, there's this, some, I'm not saying everybody, but there are these people who have this obsession with weapons and, and uh, people, I'll never forget, uh, I, I once remember a young man who asked me, he said, oh, so you're in the army? Yes, did you see combat? Yeah, he said, how many kills did you have? I was shocked that a young man would even ask me such a question ask me how many people I had killed. I looked at him, I said, young man, you're talking about taking other people's lives. This is nothing that you talk about in a cavalier fashion, nothing you talk about lightly. It's not, it's not scoring in a, in a uh, keeping score in a football game, you know? I said, these are things, these are very, very difficult things. So, and also, <laughs> it's also because of the, violence that people see in movies and TV today. Uh, people, you know, people are so desensitized to violence, desensitized to seeing people die. Uh, it, it's, it's terrible. That's also in the world today. Then on top of that, we are bombarded. We are subject to an onslaught of information day and night that bombard us, our minds. You go to like when I grew up, we didn't have television. I remember when the first TVs came, I was small. We had only one channel and that broadcast from six in the evening to 10 and that was it. Nowadays you got TV, you got 300 channels broadcasting 24 hours and uh, you go to your computer, you get all these ads. I mean, there are, there is so much, that's why it's called information technology. There's so much information bombarding your mind and vying for your attentions. And, and, and one of the uh, greatest things in life 
is to have an uncluttered mind. And that is one thing people don't have. There's such confusion. There's so many. It's hard for people to focus because their life, their minds are not at peace. They're not uncluttered, but they're cluttered with all kinds of, there's all kinds of information going through your mind uh, all the time. Even if you shut out the bad stuff, right? If you shut out the violence, shut out the pornography, shut out the bad stuff, just the stuff that is supposedly benign, bombard your mind 24 hours a day. And it wants your, demands your attention. So you have all these things. And then it makes it hard. These things make it hard for people to keep their focus. People, many people, their attention span is very little. They have a deficit when it comes to, you know, their attention span. Then on top of that, you have people who have psychological and mental issues like depressions. And some people feel live with a sense of hopelessness. They make good money. They have everything, but they feel despair. They feel anguish. They feel hopelessness. People have thoughts of suicide. They live with those because they feel that their life is not worth living. They have everything, but they feel their life isn't worth living. And other people have obsessive compulsive things. So anyway, so this is the world that we are living in. And these are the things that people are fighting with. But even people who are not fighting with these things, you know, because they live in the natural world, it's very hard for them when it comes to the things of God, the things of the spirit. And, and I will try to help you with this. And anyway, so I want to show you some scriptures. The first is the mind of the unsaved man. What does the Bible say about the mind of the regular Joe who's not saved, who does not know Jesus? In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says, in their case, the God of this world, that is Satan, Satan is the God of this world, he has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. You know, Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 18, he says, the preaching of the cross is to them who perish foolishness, but into us which are saved, it is, uh, you know, it is the power of God. So uh, for me, who is who are saved, I've seen the power, <coughs> I'm sorry, I've seen the power of God. I've seen the glory of God. I've seen dead people raised up. I've seen Jesus open blind eyes, make the lame to walk. And I, my life has been changed by Jesus in a radical fashion. So for me, Jesus is everything. And I want the whole world to know and to see the wonderful hope that is in Jesus, the power of Jesus Christ. But you go to the outside world, people are blinded. They don't see these things. I can tell them these things and they think I'm just crazy because the eyes are blinded uh, by the devil. So they see everything, but they cannot see the glory of God, which is in Jesus Christ. So, um, you know, it's the blind, how Satan blinds people. So that's the mind of the natural man. He's blinded by Satan. Now, then there's another side of the natural man which is both Christians and non-Christian people. 1 Corinthians 2.14, it says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So I said to you earlier on in this lesson that the natural man, that means uh, man in his natural state, I'm not saying a bad person, or a person who is, uh, you know, anti-Christian or anything. I'm just saying a natural man, even a good person, right? Or even even some Christians who don't uh, understand the things of the Spirit, who, who, who are Christians, but their minds operate like the minds of natural man, if you know what I mean. Because, see, the thing is that if people are not taught the things of the Spirit, they will still operate in their minds like a natural person, even though their spirits are born again, but in their minds, they will still think like a natural person. Uh, and I, I can give you examples. One example would be like, I remember back in Sweden, walking in the church and, hey, brother, how you doing? And often they would say, no, no, don't touch me. Why? Why is the flu season? I'm going to get the flu and you might get it too. And that's <clears throat> the natural man. They're thinking like the natural person. 
And they're not taking into account what Jesus has done for us upon the cross at Calvary, that he bore my diseases and this protection for me. You know, they don't take that into account. They're good people. They love Jesus, but they still think like the natural man in their mind. So it says that the natural man receives not the things of the spirit of God because the natural man he operates in the realm of the natural with his natural mind and the natural mind does not have the capacity uh, to understand the things of the Holy Spirit because the natural man is not designed to, uh, to operate in that capacity. Because why? Because you see, when he hears the things of the Spirit of God, they're foolishness to him. They're foolishness to him because they're outlandish. They're outside the realm of uh, his uh, his understanding. He says, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So a person has to be spiritual to uh, to be able to see, uh, to discern between A and B and C and D. Now, you know, let, let me pause here a while. You see, the way God has created us, uh, man is actually uh, spirit, soul, and body. Now, I'm not saying we are a trinity like God. We are not. We are a man is one, but he has three components, if you may say. One is the spiritual, the spirit, that's the inner man, that's the eternal part of you. And the other is the soul. The soul is the, uh, is the, uh, is your mind, your will, your emotions, and your body. And your body is this temple, the house that is made of dust that you live in and each has its own function. Now, the the spirit of man uh, in Proverbs 10, 27, it says the spirit of the man is the candle of the Lord. So that's the spirit of the man. That's where God speaks to you. When you get born again, that's the part of you that is made totally new. And because, you know, another scripture says deep calleth unto the deep. So when the spirit of God moves on you, he moves on your spirit. And so, uh, you, you know, you, you have your spirit, man. When you are born again, that part of you is born again. And that's where Jesus lives or the Holy Spirit lives, right? Then you've got the soul. The soul is the will, the mind, the intellect, and I said the body. Now, each one of these three have to be developed in their own realm because in the with your spirit, you touch the spiritual realm. Now with your spirit, because you touch the spiritual realm with your spirit, so you have to develop your spirit to understand uh, spiritual things and to operate in the spiritual realm. So how do you develop your spirit? Well, you need to feed it the word. The word, the physical word is food. Uh, the word of God is food for your spirit, man. So because Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that come, proceeded from the mouth of God. He was talking about the spirit of man and he was talking about spiritual food for the spiritual man. So you need to feed your spirit, man, the food of the word. And then uh, food isn't enough. You have to exercise to develop your spirit. And what is what is exercise? Well, exercise is exercising faith and prayer. When you you feeding your spirit is feeding it the word and faith and prayer are the exercise of the spirit. That's when you exercise your spirit. And that's how you develop your spirit by the word of God and by prayer and by, by exercise. And exercise means operating in faith and instant obedience to when the Holy Spirit speaks to you. These are the things you do to develop your spirit. Now, to develop your soul, your mind is... Uh, Education, you know, if you uh, like a lot of people, they're scientifically, their minds are well developed because they, are, they studied. So you study, you get an education and you develop your mind. A well developed mind is an educated mind, um, you know, getting an education and studying and maybe you haven't been to university, but you read a lot of books, a lot of periodicals written by serious people, you'll have a well-developed man. Now, I'm not saying reading books and conspiracy theories. A lot of people, they don't like to read. They just spend time on YouTube and the internet reading garbage. That will not develop your mind. But reading serious stuff, you know, that will, uh, it can be if you like to read Christian things, read good, serious Christian books, not politically slanted things, but really good uh, you know, you read Kenneth e. Hagin, read A.W. Tozer, read Andrew Murray, and there's a plethora of, of spiritual men and women who have written great books. Read those books and 
and uh, discuss those things with your friends. And that's how you develop your intellect, uh, your spirit, you know, your, the spiritual part of your, uh, I mean, your intellect when it comes to uh, spiritual things. And then you can develop your intellect in the sciences by reading scientific works and books or going to university or, you know, like my two boys, they, they studied uh, computers. They went to uh, one of the top private universities here in the U.S. and they are like geniuses. You know, they create programs and all that. I don't have that ability because I don't have that education. So you can develop your intellect. Now, your physical body you can develop by feeding it nutritious food, good food, food that is healthy for you, and exercising, walking, running, lifting weights. So you so a lot of people have well developed bodies because. They eat right, they exercise right, uh, and they may have well-developed minds because they read and they study, but spiritually they're very weak because they don't spend much time on the, uh, in the Word of God or in prayer. So you have people who eat three meals a day and they go to, they study every day, but their spirit gets a cold sandwich in the church they go to once a week. So you wonder, why these people who are good people, uh, they're strong physically and strong mentally, emotionally, but they're so weak spiritually. So we have to develop both our spirit, our soul and our body, um, you know, because all three have been given to us by God. So for your spirit, you study the word of God, spend time in prayer, spend time in the word and you, you know, you develop your spiritual man. You spend time in prayer and act in faith and do things of faith. And in the mental area, you read books, you get an education, develop your intellect. That's how you become strong intellectually, mentally. Then in the physical area, you eat right, you exercise right. Don't eat hamburgers every day. Eat right, exercise right. Just take care of your body and you'll be strong. So, uh, so, so, but I'm, I'm, I went into all this, took a little rabbit trail, sidetrack there trying to tell you, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They can't because they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So if you uh, want to come out of acting like a natural man and acting like a spiritual man, so you have to develop your spirit so you can discern things spiritually. Amen. Now the last scripture, well, I'll, I'll share more with you tomorrow, but let's have a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, pray for my brothers and sisters. Thank you, Father, for their lives. Thank you for your plans and purposes for them. Father, you said, Lord, that you bless our food and water, turn every sickness away from us, and I speak your blessing, your life and mercy upon every home, upon every family, Father. Let them know your blessings, your power, your healing, your grace upon their lives in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, praise God. I'll see you again tomorrow. Bless you.